Good morning. My name is Kathy Jo Robbins, and I'm with the Office of Infectious Disease Prevention and Control with the State of Delaware Department of Public Health. Welcome to our Provider Education Rabies webinar. We're going to start this morning with introductions. Good morning, Dr. Riley. Good morning. I'm glad to be here this morning with you all, and I look forward to sharing information on rabies. As a background, I am Dr. Doug Riley. I am a veterinarian who works both for the state and in private practice. And again, I look forward to becoming part of the solution to the rabies equation. Thank you very much for attending. Good morning, Jamie. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jamie Ehlers. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist with the state of Delaware, and I'm responsible for zoonotic diseases such as rabies. Thank you, Jamie, and good morning, Desiree. Good morning. My name is Desiree Bechtel. I'm a nurse consultant for Division of Public Health, Infectious Disease Prevention and Control. Thank you for joining. Thank you. So this morning, we're going to be talking about animal and human rabies and rabies exposures, what that looks like, wound care, pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis, and indicators, diagnostic testing, and PPE for human rabies cases. Our objectives today are to understand the risks, become familiar, understand protocol recommendations, utilize our digital rabies exposure reporting form, which will be very important, and identifying indicators of human rabies cases. Doug? Good day to everyone again. Again, my hope as the state public health veterinarian today is to step towards a closer relationship between the various medical professionals and Delaware public health to forge a symbiotic relationship that strengthens the delivery of health and opens new doors for shared and emerging information across the spectrum of healthcare. The hope is that the Department of Public Health will be viewed as an additional tool in your toolbox and like a hammer have multiple uses. To begin, I would like to go back to a story that was written a long time ago. It goes like this. Late one moonlit night, three fictional revelers on an English moor were transfixed by a horrific sight. In their words, a foul thing, a great black beast shaped like a hound, yet larger than any hound that ever mortal eye has rested upon. And even as they looked, the thing toured the throat out of Hugo Baskerville on which, as it turned its eyes and dripping jaws upon them, the three shrieked with fear and rode for dear life. Historians of medicine have traced the terror that the Hound of the Baskervilles evoked in Arthur Conan Doyle's bands to the profound impact of rabies on contemporary British consciousness. With an ability to turn the most flaccid of pets into frothing, raging beasts, and an almost 100% mortality rate, the rabies virus was, or still is, one of the most feared scourges in human history, as well as today. Rabies itself is a fatal but preventable viral disease. It can spread to people and pets if they are bitten or scratched by a rabid animal. In the United States, rabies is mostly found in wild animals like bats, raccoons, skunk, and foxes. However, in many other countries, dogs still carry rabies. The most and most rabies deaths in people around the world are caused by dog bites. The rabies virus infects the central nervous system. 
And if a person does not receive the appropriate medical care after a potential rabies exposure, the virus can cause disease in the brain, ultimately resulting in death. Rabies can be prevented by vaccinating pets, staying away from wildlife, and seeking medical care after potential exposures before symptoms start. Next slide. Rhabdoviruses. We need to remember that rab rhabdoviruses are widespread among a great diversity of organisms, such as vertebrates, which include mammals, birds, reptiles, and fish. It's also found in invertebrates, which would be the insects, arachnids, and crustaceans, as well as in plants. Several members of the rhabdoviridae are associated with very significant pathologies in humans as well as livestock. The two most studied genera are the Lassa virus and the vesiculoviruses. We all understand that the Lassa viruses infect only mammals in whom they cause deadly encephalopathies. The prototypic of the genus is the rabies virus, AKA RABV, and in the larger animals, is the vesicular virus, which is the prototypic vesicular stomatitis virus. On the side, vesicular stomatitis viruses are not common in the United States. However, they have emerged on the West Coast as of recently. Next slide. The CDC defined rabies in humans as an acute progressive encephalomyelitis that is nearly always fatal once symptoms begin. Interestingly, acute in medical terminology is a severe and sudden condition, which would be likened to a fractured bone or an asthma attack. However, in common language, acute is bad, difficult or unwelcome situation or phenomenon, regardless of which definition we are looking at, we can all agree that the outcome for untreated rabies is horrific and terminal for the patient at this time. Next slide. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Doug. So I'm going to be moving on to animal rabies here in Delaware. So in 2022, the Delaware Public Health Laboratory tested 198 animal specimens in total. Of those 198, 11 came back positive for rabies. If you look at the diagram on the right-hand side, you will see the confirmed rabies cases by year and species with a positivity rate from 2018 to 2022. So if you look closely, you'll see that the rabies vector kind of varies each year. In 2022, we commonly saw the cat and the fox, in 2021, we saw the bat and so on. So the raccoon, bat, cat, and fox are some of the most common rabies vectors for the state of Delaware. Um, and you may have noticed that we frequently see cats. These tend to be stray and feral cats due to the interactions that humans have with these animals in particular. So it's also worth noting that our public health laboratory primarily tests animals that have a known human exposure. On rare occasions, we will test when there is an animal on animal altercation or for no exposures, but generally we test when there's a human exposure. Next slide. Moving on to human rabies in Delaware. So in 2022, we saw 2,360 reports of potential human exposures to rabies. Of these reports, we recommended post-exposure prophylaxis for 637 people. This may seem like a pretty high number. It is because of a variety of reasons. It can range anywhere from the owner not cooperating with animal welfare or the individual not having owner information and so on. So out of an abundance of caution, we tend to recommend post-exposure prophylaxis for the person that was exposed. In 2018, we did detect our first case of human rabies since 1941. So this case was a Kent County woman who was found to be infected it is still currently unknown how the woman contracted rabies, but stray cats were found to be living on her property. Next slide. 
So moving on to exposure reporting for Delaware. So generally when I discuss an exposure, I'm looking at a bite, scratch, or saliva exposure. But more specifically, rabies exposures are defined as situations where the saliva or brain slash nervous system tissue of a potentially infectious animal is introduced into a bite wound, open cuts in the skin, which can be from a nail or a tooth, or onto mucous membranes such as the mouth or eyes. And all of these exposures, regardless of the vaccination status of the animal, should be reported to us within 24 hours. To report these exposures, we are collecting this data in a survey, which is contained in REDCap. REDCap is a secure web application for building and managing online surveys and databases. So to report this exposure, please select our link below, which will come out following this presentation. Next slide. And that will bring you to our Delaware Public Health Rabies webpage. You'll see that there's a provider section that has an abundance of resources. You would select report potential rabies exposure circled here. Next slide. Which will ultimately bring you to the survey. There are three different incident types. There is human exposure, animal exposure, or human and animal. So because this is targeting human healthcare providers, you would either select human victim or human and animal depending on the nature of the exposure. Next slide. So what animals can get rabies? So it's very important to know which animals are capable of contracting the rabies virus to determine the risk for your patient. So as I mentioned previously, the most common wild reservoirs of rabies are raccoons, skunks, bats, and foxes. However, domestic animals can also get rabies. So we're looking at cats, cattle, and dogs as the most frequently reported rabid, rabid domestic animal in the US. Small rodents like squirrels, hamsters, guinea pigs, and so on, and lagomorphs such as rabbits and hares are almost never found to be infected with rabies and have not been known to transmit rabies to humans. But as I mentioned, any mammal is capable of contracting the rabies virus, so we do have to screen these individuals for risk of rabies. And lastly, birds, snakes, and fish are not mammals, so they cannot get rabies and they cannot give it to you. Next slide. So when we do receive a report of a potential human exposure to rabies, we will coordinate with the Office of Animal Welfare for domestic animals such as dogs, cats, and ferrets. So what this entails is a 10-day post-exposure quarantine for the animals that we identified as exposing a human. The purpose of this quarantine is to determine the risk of rabies to the person that was exposed. So research shows that once the rabies virus is in the saliva of the animal, the animal will show symptoms of rabies and die within 10 days. So as long as the offending animal is alive and well after day 10, there is no risk of rabies from the exposure that occurred. However, if the animal were to present with symptoms of rabies and die during this quarantine, it would need to be submitted for rabies testing. It's important to note that this does not work for any other animals other than cats, dogs, and ferrets, so wild animals will need to be sent in for rabies testing. Next slide. Onto a risk assessment. So these are the questions that we encourage you to ask your patients when they come in for a potential rabies exposure. So we wanna look at what kind of animal it was. Like I mentioned, any mammal is capable of contracting rabies virus, but we would be more concerned with a bite from a raccoon compared to a bite from a squirrel. We also look at what, um, if the animal was a dog, cat, or ferret, if it was current on its rabies vaccine to determine risk of rabies. We look at um, whether or not the animal is currently exhibiting symptoms of rabies. Um, so for example, if the raccoon is stumbling, drooling, it's very aggressive, rabies would go up on our list of suspicions and we would definitely start that individual on post-exposure prophylaxis. But as I noted previously with the quarantine, not all animals that are considered infectious are currently exhibiting symptoms. So just because they're asymptomatic doesn't mean that rabies is off the table. We also wanna look at whether or not this is a provoked or unprovoked exposure. For example, if the person is walking past a bush and a raccoon runs out and bites them in comparison to somebody trying to pick up a stray cat that's on their property. And lastly, we wanna determine if the victim has ever received the rabies vaccine in the past. This will help determine the risk of them developing rabies from the exposure and will guide our recommendation for a booster um, opposed to having to start the whole rabies vaccine. 
Next slide. Thank you, Jamie. And now Desiree. Hello, um, we're gonna start off by reviewing some positive indicators for rabies in humans. The neurological signs that are present with rabies disease are consistent with encephalophis and or myel myelitis. First symptoms that present with rabies disease are flu-like symptoms, including weakness, discomfort, fever, or headache. Discomfort, prickling sensation, and itching may occur at the site of the bite or scratch. Symptoms then progress to cerebral dysfunction, anxiety, confusion, or agitation. As the disease progresses, the person may experience delirium, abnormal behavior, hallucinations, hydrophobia, which is the fear of water, and insomnia. The acute period of disease typically ends after two to 10 days. Once clinical signs of rabies appear, the disease is nearly always fatal and treatment is typically supportive. If the neurological signs have been present for longer than two to three weeks, another neurological condition or disease should be considered. Ruling out other etiologies of encephalitis will also be a positive indicator that rabies illness is causing the neurological signs. Next slide. The path of rabies virus passes from the muscle at the site of the bite or the scratch to the brain through the nerves. When the virus reaches the brain, it multiplies. Then it moves from the brain to the salivary glands and saliva. Rabies is not a bloodborne disease, and one specific test is not sufficient for diagnosis. Samples collected for testing include saliva, serum, spinal fluid, and skin biopsies of hair follicles. Next slide, please. The human rabies post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP protocol algorithm can be found on the state rabies website as a reference. It is important to take into consideration what kind of animal the person was bitten by as discussed previously. If it is not a mammal that is commonly known to be a carrier of the rabies virus, then PEP is not recommended. If the animal is available for a 10-day quarantine, develop symptoms or dies during quarantine and lab tests are confirmed or inter indeterminate, PEP is recommended. If the animal did not die or develop symptoms within the 10 day quarantine, testing usually does not occur and PEP is not recommended. Next slide, please. Human rabies immunoglobulin, also referred to as HRIG, is the rabies biologics used for PEP for people who have not received pre-exposure prophylaxis, also known as PrEP, and have not received PEP previously according to the APIC recommendations. The recommended products, potencies, and doses are listed on the slide. The administration route rec recommendations are to administer local infiltration around the wound at 20 units per kilogram with the remaining HRIG administered intramuscularly in an anatomical site distant from where the vaccine was placed. Next slide. Human rabies vaccine is used in persons that meet recommendations for pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis. The biologics, product names, and potencies is as listed on the slide. Be sure to follow manufacturer's recommendations on reconstitution, the route of administration is in the intramuscular deltoid area for adults or the anterolateral aspect of the thigh for children. Do not use the gluteal area for the rabies vaccine. Next slide. The combination of HRIG and the rabies vaccine is recommended for both bite and non-bite exposures, regardless of the interval between exposure and initiation of treatment. PEP intervention of persons not previously vaccinated include wound cleaning, HRIG administration around the wound site, and then administer any remaining intramuscularly, and the rabies vaccine administration on days 0, 3, 7, and 14. If a person was previously vaccinated, HRIG should not be administered. 
and the rabies vaccine is recommended only on days zero and three. Next slide. The site wound care treatment is as listed on the slide. Make sure that you clean well with soap and water. Do not scrub as it may damage the tissue. Gently hold pressure with the clean cloth to stop the bleeding. If anatomically feasible, HRIG full dose of 20 IUs per kilogram should be infiltrated around and into the wound. Apply an antibacterial ointment to the clean wound, then apply a sterile dressing, and make sure that you monitor for signs and symptoms of infection. Standard precautions recommended include gowns, gloves, mask, and eye protection. Keep in mind that the rabies virus is transmitted through direct contact, such as through broken skin or mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, or mouth with infectious tissues or fluids. Infectious tissue or fluids include tears, nervous tissue, saliva, and respiratory tract fluids. Blood, urine, and feces are not infectious. Next. Thank you, Desiree. And now to Dr. Doug Riley. Well, I certainly hope that this presentation thus far has been very informative to you all. Um, it is very important that we all understand that the categories of risk and the methodology for treatment and prevention change. And the MMWR recently came out with a change to the PrEP or the pre-exposure prophylaxis in people. Um, so the big change was in risk category one and risk category two. Risk category one are simply those people who work with the live concentrated virus, such as in a laboratory and risk category Two are people who handle and work around bats or work in a high density area with bats. It used to be that they received three doses of PrEP. However, the recommendation, as you can see on the slide, has been changed to two doses of PrEP. Their titers have not changed. So category one would be every six months, whereas category two would be every two years. The other change came in risk category group three. Risk category group three, the people mainly involved in this group would be people who care for animals and have a longer exposure than three years as defined in the who is typically affects. And that would be veterinarians, veterinary technicians, and people who work in rehab centers or people who like the Office of Animal Welfare. So they actually receive two different groupings. One is a two dose and then a titer. And the other one is they get one booster between the two doses and they no longer require a titer. The risk category four is very similar to risk category three, but they have less exposure time. So now you're looking at people who travel or need to have the vaccine because they will be in contact for a shorter period of time. The reason we're bringing this up is you need to understand the patient who walks in the door who has been bitten. Because if you were to give them the H rig when they were pre exposed, prophylaxed, you would mute or diminish the response of the treatment to the patient. So, again, for you, it's more important that you understand the patient. And if the patient is conscious, then you won't have any problems, but you need to understand again what the patient is and what they do before you to begin the treatment. And that goes back to the questioning of the actual patient. Next slide. So there are some precautions and there are contraindications for the rabies vaccine itself. So if you have immunosuppressed individuals, such as individuals who received a, a organ transplant or who are, are on immunosuppressive medications, you need to take that into account on your post-exposure therapy because sometimes you will have a muted response to the vaccine. So the PrEP recommendations for immunocompromised individuals is you add an additional dose of the diploid cell vaccine on day 28. 
So instead of doing day zero, three, seven, 14, you would add the 28 day separation. And it would probably be a good idea to evaluate and test the serum to determine the effectiveness of the antibody response. Again, this is for immunocompromised individuals. Now, if we look at pregnancy and you know, and I know that pregnancy, the individual is semi-immunocompromised because they are carrying a fetus. However, there is no contraindication to the vaccine in a pregnant individual. According to the CDC, there have been multiple studies that increase, that show there is no increased incident of abortion, premature deaths, or fetal abnormalities associated with the vaccines that are used. So again, pregnancy is one of those things that you have to look at, but we have to understand the virus. The virus will kill the host. So your alternative, if you don't vaccinate, is you potentially will, ha will have a dead patient. So you have to make sure we treat the pregnant individuals just like any other individual, because again, there is no contraindication to pregnancies. Allergies. So here's where we run into a problem because any vaccine, as you know, you can have severe hypersensitivities and rabies is no different. However, you have to complete the series, which means that you need to make sure that you have appropriate medications in your crash cart because these reactions will become more severe as you get further into the therapy, especially if it's with the actual diploid cell vaccine, because you have a minimum of four that you have to give and sometimes five. So as you give the vaccines with each vaccine, the reaction to the vaccine may become heightened. So just be cognizant of the patient and make sure they do sit there 15 minute dwell time and you record that information and preemptively treat before you get the vaccine or be prepared to treat afterwards. So what are the vaccine adverse reactions to that we're gonna see? So typically in the human diploid cell vaccine, which is the one of the vaccines, it's very similar to the purified chick embryo cell vaccine, which are the two that are authorized in the United States. What are you gonna see? Well, you're gonna see the same kind of reactions you would see in any vaccine. You're gonna see redness and pain, and sometimes you'll see an induration. You may have mild systemic reactions, such as a fever, a headache. They may have some slight neurological uh, signs as well as some gastrointestinal issues. And remember, going back to the last side, there are those patients that will have an immediate systemic hypersensitivity reaction, those you need to make sure you're treating. And you also need to be aware that there is a potential for having reactions that are very similar to Guillain-Barre. So you need to be prepared to treat those, those issues as well. There are occasional but very rare central and peripheral nervous system disorders but these have been more associated with the HDCV or the human diploid cell vaccine. So with the purified chick embryo cell vaccine, it's very similar to the diploid cell vaccine. So just be aware of which vaccine you're using because that vaccine has to be used throughout the series. As for the HRIG, which is at the very beginning of your treatment, Typically what you're going to have is a local reaction, pain and tenderness, but when you're injecting that much immunoglobulin into the bite site, that would not be an unexpected finding. And the most common systemic reaction you're gonna see is headaches. Rarely will you see any seizure activity with the HRIG. Next slide. So we have gone through a lot of information today, um, looked at different problems that you may face with the patient, with the vaccine. And we, I'm just going to try to re-emphasize with this slide a few very important points. If you're looking to the far left of the slide, you'll notice a child with facial bites. Um, typically, rabies is considered a urgency, a medical urgency and not an emergent problem. However, 
when you look at this child, you are looking at life limb and eyesight. So this becomes an emergency for eyesight, but it also becomes an emergency for the rabies virus, especially if you have a high suspicion because behind the eye is a cranial nerve and that nerve is very closely associated with the brain, which means that your incubation period can go from weeks and months to days and hours. So this becomes an emergent problem for rabies. So this is why contacting the Department of Public Health if you have questions, understanding the virus and understanding the risks and your risk analysis for is this a provoked or non-provoked attack is very, very important. So if we drop down to the cat, the cat whether it's feral or it's not feral is a potential exposure. We in the United States have a bit of an advantage over the rest of the world, because if you look at the two on the bottom, the dog and the cat, and there's also the ferret, but those three are by law required to be vaccinated for rabies, which means that you have a hedge of protection around your population that is created by the veterinary community and the compliance of the pet owner. So that, that simply reduces the risks because you're typically going to see a dog in a house, if it has rabies or a cat, it's feral, they will bite a person. It was not as common for the raccoon to scoot out from under the trees and attack a person. So again, we have a hedge of protection in the United States and that gives you a little bit of air to breathe. Now, if we go up one, the shark, the shark obviously is not a mammal and it does not carry the rabies virus. So if you have someone come in who has been bit by a shark, it would be simply a shark attack. And while it would be much more gruesome than a cat bite, it would just need to be treated appropriately. If we move to the right, the raccoon, the raccoon in the state of Delaware is the carrier of the raccoon variant, and the raccoon variant is endemic to the state of Delaware. So raccoons are always a sus suspect for rabies, as well as in some states, the bat. The bat is not as high a carrier in the state of Delaware. However, we have had positive bats with rabies, and any bat that's found in the house with people who has been in there in the living spaces needs to be considered an exposure. Now, if we go to the upper right, that would be a dolphin. A dolphin is a mammal. So as such, if you remember in the beginning, we said all mammals can be infected with the rabies virus. The dolphin is not immune. So again, this goes back to the appropriate history, making sure we understand what's going on with the patient and what source the virus may have come from. The tarantula just below the dolphin is, is no, not a carrier of rabies. And the parrot or the California conure on the bottom is also not a carrier of rabies. So if you have a patient come in who has been bit by a parrot, um, don't think rabies because it's not going to be a problem with the parrot. Treatment of the wound would be your primary concern at that point. Again, looking at the slide, there are reasons we have these pictures up here. And for me, the far left is the most important, understanding the risk and, how, and the urgency associated with the bite. Next slide. So again, we've had talked a great deal about rabies in the United States. And I think it's very important that you also understand rabies as a global threat because people move, people go on vacations, and they go into places that are rabies endemic. And a lot of these places are rabies endemic for the canine variant. So currently, rabies is responsible for upwards of 59 to 60,000 agonizing human deaths per year, of which 40% are children. Most of these people are living in poor rural communities in Africa and Asia that are farthest from medical and veterinary services. In addition, millions of dogs and other animals suffered from, suffer and die due to both the disease and the indiscriminate culling prompted by the fear of the disease. Going back to my initial slide, the scourge. 
So people still fear this disease and they have a right to fear this disease because it is a very bad way to die. Rabies is recognized as one of the 20 neglected tropical diseases by the World Health Organization. Again, rabies is a preventable disease that overwhelmingly affects the poor, both in terms of its death toll and the associated financial burden. Annual economic losses because of the disease are around 8.6 billion US dollars, mostly due to premature deaths, but also because of spending on human vaccines, lost income for victims and animal bites, and other associated costs. With a survival rate of less than 0.1%, those exposed to the virus face a stark choice. Go in search of a series of vaccines and immunoglobulin that prevent the onset of the disease, better known as post-exposure prophylaxis, or die. In some cases, post-exposure prophylaxis costs more than the monthly household income, and families are known to either go into debt to pay for PEP or sell livestock on which they depend for income. Both are options that negatively affect families' future prospects. Rabies can destroy millions of families, literally, through death, emotionally, as well as financially, making this truly a horrific disease. Next slide. So thank you, Doug and Jamie and Desiree. If you have questions or need additional information, feel free to visit our rabies webpage at dhss.delaware.gov. You can also send your questions to our secure email at reportdisease at delaware.gov. For questions, feel free to call 302 744-4771 for general questions during business hours. But if you have a 24-hour emergency and you need to reach us, visit, I'm sorry, call 888-295-5156. Here is our list of resources, and we'd like to thank you for joining us today. We will have this information available to you. Feel free again to email us at reportdisease at delaware.gov. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy your day.